Hello, everybody. I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Um, we have a couple of lectures, uh, three total. I'll be getting done with you this afternoon to cover the uh, area of head and neck as well as uh, thyroid and parathyroid, all of which uh, I have been uh, academically involved with in terms of care and lecturing. Um, I think you'll find that all three lectures will be very target rich. Each subject has a real opportunity to spend a lot of time on each of them, but I've made this very practical so that it covers uh, really what you need at a board level with some discussion about some of the nuances on clinical decision making, but really always in the context that this should be a practical dis discussion towards being successful with the uh, uh, board uh, exam. <clears throat> Let's start with head and neck surgery. So this subject, we will cover a uh, very specific topics that I would say are target rich. Again, this is a subject that is so broad as a subspecialist in this area. Um, so clearly uh, we have to select out one of the, some of the key things uh, that you need to know and review. Neck mass is at the centerpiece of all of this. Uh, this also includes uh, questions around staging and management of each of the subsites. Uh, neck dissection is a, a sort of hallmark of board review. Uh, a lot of board examinations uh, want, to under, want to see if you understand the nomenclature on neck dissection, but more specifically, what type of neck dissection is being done for which situation. And we will definitely cover that. There has been updates on the uh, TNM staging system. We'll make sure you understand that. And then we'll, we'll cover uh, the nuances of uh, the remaining two subjects that you see there. <clears throat> so um, I, I typically try to highlight our discussions uh, uh, with uh, cases, at least in this presentation. So the first uh, pre first uh, case we wanna talk about is, the is this question, the most common cause of a neck mass in males over 60 years of age is, answer, A, bacterial lymphadenitis, B, branchial cleft cysts, metastatic cancer, laryngocele carotid body tumor. Answer, uh, correct. I'm glad to see that uh, we got interaction on chat. Unfortunately, not doing a live uh, presentation takes away my uh, immediate uh, human interaction with you. So I don't get to see your faces and so forth, but that's okay. So let's take advantage of the chat. That is correct. Uh, metastatic cancer. Um, basically anybody with a neck mask greater than 40 years of age is cancer until proven otherwise. So this is an easy one uh, and uh, one that you should not get wrong when this question is asked of you. Um, <clears throat> so metastatic carcinoma, correct. Uh, there's a long list of uh, different causes for neck mass. What we'll do is we'll focus on congenital um, based on its cystic manifestation, which uh, requires of you the understanding of, uh, of the etiology. Inflammatory, we really won't cover it except to mention some key things. Basically, the short version about the inflammatory is needle biopsies will either tell you you're heading down the neoplastic versus the inflammatory, and uh, the FNA will uh, sort of put you in this category, but we'll really focus on the neoplastic part as the main part of our discussion. Let's talk about congenital. The key feature of congenital, and I'm really gonna cover two out of the three topics because that's really all you need to know from this category. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of things we can do to be complete about a category, but again, I wanna be practical for the sake of uh, uh, the boards. So the first one is branchial cleft cyst. And um, what we recognize about branchial cleft cyst is that these cysts develop from the arches within the embryologic development process during pregnancy where the fold of the embryologic uh, plate will come together and create spaces that eventually are obliterated. Uh, and that is within the spaces of the arches. The first, second, third, and fourth arch uh, in association with the head and neck area um, give rise to these uh, branchial cleft cysts. The most common, is the second arch branchial cleft cyst. So to the question, what's the most common congenital etiology for branchial cleft cyst, the answer is second arch. Um, one of the critical things towards this presentation is that a branchial cleft cyst can make its first presentation as an adult. In other words, a patient can go for um, years on end in terms of their pediatric adolescent development and have no manifestation of a cystic process or a congenital cyst until their first development of that cyst, which was sitting quietly and compressed, and then at an adult age, maybe after an upper respiratory infection, for example, that cyst uh, be, uh, becomes inflamed and then enlarges and shows for the first time as an adult. So the lack of a cystic manifestation during childhood or adolescence does not preclude the diagnosis 
of a branchial cleft cyst. The presentation of the second arch is a typically along the anterior border of the SCM, what's the SCM sternoclinomastoid muscle, and then the tract drains into the tonsil. Um, if you wanna be more specific about uh, the tract, you need to understand that the cyst actually uh, uh, develops, this is the location of the anterior, anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, and then this would be the, and so you can see the cyst right there, and then this would be the, hang on a second, this would be the uh, diagram of where the cyst is along that anterior border, which would be the sternocleidomastoid here, and then the track, which travels over the cranial nerve, specifically cranial nerve 12 and cranial nerve 9, uh, cranial 12 and cranial nerve 9, and not around, but in between the bifurcation of the carotid and into what structure? The tonsil. So um, a lot of people are always looking at the second arch diagram and trying to memorize what it looks like, but really all you have to remember is over, over, in between, and into the tonsil, over uh, the two cranial nerves in between the carotid bifurcation and into the tonsil. Why, why go through the pains of describing this? Well, in part because uh, some reflection of knowledge you know, may be asked of you in terms of uh, the tract, uh, probably more specifically where it drains. But the other thing you need to understand is a successful removal of branchial cleft cyst that prevents recurrence is removal not just of the cyst, but as much of this tract as possible, and therefore an understanding of the tract's path to avoid injury and, and be complete in the removal. Um, <clears throat> The second congenital etiology is thyroglossal duct cyst. And as with the branchial cleft cyst, it will also have an adult manifestation without necessarily having a pediatric manifestation. Um, I should mention that both of these cysts will typically present in a pediatric, in, in a pediatric patient as a cyst, but, and it's less typical to present as an adult, but it can, as I keep uh, mentioning, present without any manifestation as a pediatric patient and then have an adult manifestation later. Anyway, the thyroglossal duct cyst is more midline, unlike the branchial cleft cyst, which is lateral. Uh, its track arises from the head and neck version of the foramen cecum, not the GI version. The uh, head and neck version is the foramen cecum is located where? At the base of the tongue. And that foramen cecum drops the ductal cyst, um, which then that duct travels where? It travels down through the hyoid bone. And then what does it give rise to? What is the thyroglossal duct responsible for embryologically? The development of the thyroid. So what you'll see as a remnant of that thyroglossal duct in the existing thyroid of an adult is the pyramidal lobe of the thyroid, which then is the remaining distal end of the thyroglossal duct. Um, along that tract of this duct, is where the thyroglossal duct cysts can form and typically in relationship to the hyoid bone, which leads to the definition of the procedure that is utilized to uh, remove the thyroglossal duct cyst, which is the cyst trunk procedure. And what defines the cyst trunk procedure? Again, like a branchial cleft cyst, you mustn't focus just on removal of the cyst, otherwise recurrence will occur. You must include the tract. Well, in the case of a thyroglossal duct cyst removal, otherwise referred to a cyst trunk procedure, you not only need to remove the cyst, but the location where the tract passed through, which is where the body, the central portion of the hyoid bone, just above the laryngeal complex. And so the cyst is the, the cyst trunk uh, uh, procedure is removal of the thyroglossal duct cyst, cyst along with the body of the hyoid. And that's critical. You remove uh, the thyroglossal duct cyst alone without the body of the hyoid, and you will have a higher recurrence rate. This is a typical location and manifestation in a pediatric patient with thyroglossal duct cyst. One of the things you'll notice about these cysts is when the tongue is protruded, the cyst will rise. That covers our congenital etiology and the common feature of the congenital etiology is the cystic neck mass manifestation. Let's talk about inflammatory um, by just mentioning that there are a number of things that can cause inflammatory, both uh, viral and bacterial where the lymph node becomes inflamed and enlarges in reaction and then typically dissipates. So lymph nodes will come and go uh, in light of a inflammatory response. One thing that falls into this category of inflammatory is indeed granulomatous disease, such as uh, um, caseating granulomatous disease uh, related to TB. And then finally, the non-caseating version of granulomatous disease, which is what? Sarcoidosis. So sarcoidosis is one of the 
uh, uh, manifestations of a neck mass, or let me just say one of the differential uh, for a neck mass includes um, uh, sarcoidosis and would manifest on needle biopsy with granulomatous changes. Let's talk about um, the key topic of neoplastic etiology. Um, neoplastic etiology could be divided into primary versus metastatic. Let's talk about primary first. Primary tumors, as the term, as you know, in, uh, defines there are tumors that arise primarily from the structure. So in the case of a lymph node lymphoma or salivary tumors, thyroid tumors, and the all important consideration, vascular neurogenic. Let's, talk, let's just look at a couple examples. This is uh, multiple and large lymph nodes that are persisting uh, beyond three weeks. Uh, as we said, uh, viral or bacterial etiology will often uh, dissipate and not persist beyond a three to six week period and any persistence of those nodes or multiple nodes in this sort of uh, presentation uh, raises the question of lymphoma. And certainly a needle biopsy will point you in that direction when the cytopathology report shows changes of a homogeneous pattern of lymphocytes that would be consistent with lymphoma. Salivary um, are pretty obvious on exam. Uh, where the parotid gland uh, or the submandibular gland have within uh, the mass, uh, I'm sorry, have within the gland, the mass itself often confirmed on radiographic evaluation, but can often be discerned on physical exam. Uh, 